Okay, but hello and welcome back to uh, lecture 19 of this uh, bio microelectromechanical system. We will begin again by a quick preview of the last lecture. Uh, we tried to cover uh, some of the basics of uh, uh, the electrophoresis process uh, as uh, you know we normally do it. It is uh, it's essentially the motion of a charge in an external electric field through a sieving media. Uh, we also talked about uh, certain basic derivations of uh, electrophoretic mobility, velocity, so on and so forth. Uh, we demonstrated some gen gel electrophoresis of DNA uh, in laboratory scale, uh, essentially uh, something where you can do size based fractionation by moving it through a gel and trying to determine or uh, make various mobilities on the basis of a lens as opposed to frictional forces that a molecule would. Uh, in you know kind of experience as it moves through a series of sieves uh, in, in the nanometer scale. Uh, we also tried to kind of estimate what does a DNA analysis lab normally comprise of, what kind of components it has. It has uh, a DNA preparation unit, uh, a mixture unit, the PCR thermocycler, uh, it has again electrophoresis uh, mechanism and the readout bench and also talked about some concepts where this whole lab can be miniaturized onto a single chip level okay we then uh, described or started talking about capillary electrophoresis which is an offshoot also of the human genome uh, project and the rapidity that was dictated by this project and uh, we'll try to kind of uh, continue in this area and explore this a little more so capillary electrophoresis essentially is the electrophoresis of dna in uh, thin microcapillaries 70 to 100 microns in thickness and uh, one of the advantages that capillary electrophoresis has to offer is uh, in terms of a higher surface area to volume ratio of uh, the gel material which is filled in a channel and uh, due to this uh, surface area prominence uh, there is a huge heat transfer uh, coefficient so that uh, so the way that heat is uh, transferred to the environment is increased tremendously which allows us to go for a higher amount of voltage or uh, to sustain higher amount of fields uh, without the gel getting melted okay and uh, therefore uh, you know, this can be utilized to an advantage wherein these high voltages or fields can be used to rapidly translate and fractionate several base pairs of dna uh, the rapidity can be uh, to a scale which is almost 160th times uh, in terms of times uh, of fractionation from normal uh, gel electrophoresis process. So, this uh, right here is an illustration of uh, how it would really look like. So, as you see in uh, this figure here, uh, we are talking about uh, a case where there is a crisscross channel, right. This channel here right now is uh, essentially for loading the DNA sample, okay, this channel here, and the other white channel, as you are seeing here, uh, is essentially for translating the DNA and causing the electrophoresis to happen. Uh, the loading can take place either electrokinetically where uh, the DNA is injected into this gel material here at this uh, particular juncture uh, by uh, giving an electric field a separate electric field. A perpendicular electric field in this direction is provided uh, to kind of translate whatever has been trapped in here for the DNA and uh, into this particular capillary right. So, if you essentially present a negative electrode. Okay. Uh, so, if you present uh, something like a negative electrode here, uh, excuse me, and uh, a, a positive electrode here, uh, there would be a tendency of these DNA molecules to move through this gel. Okay, and uh, as they move, uh, they would kind of uh, fractionate, and the sizes. Uh, as is obvious here in this channel would be separated okay and you can do a readout by using either a capillary uh, uh, sorry a, a waveguide system or something which can be integrated onto the same planet level this is a black and white mask uh, this is another mask where of a different dimension and uh, these are some of the images of uh, how the final device looks like so essentially it is a glass pdms device we have talked about replication processes using pdms earlier a mask is prepared, a master is prepared and uh, the, the device is made in two layers with a lower glass transparent glass layer 
bonded to an upper PDMS layer which has the channels carved in or molded in or replicated inside and uh, there are ports essentially for loading and loading the gel material as well as uh, the samples and this is a scheme again where uh, it shows how the samples are loaded here as you see there is a green plug like flow here of the DNA sample there is a thin plug which has been inserted by continuous flow in this empty channel through this cross channel the loading channel and uh, once this plug is kind of um, uh, formulated here uh, there is liquid uh, gel which is uh, poured from both sides and this is adjusted accordingly the idea is that this uh, gel when it gets into the capillary gets almost immediately solidified so therefore you have to be very careful about the rapidity with which it needs to be done so there is the gel uh, from this side and then another gel uh, solution from this side when you allow it to cool it develops a thin gel, gel layer inside the capillary with a plug the green plug here containing the DNA now if you send a, a positive and negative uh, electrodes through these uh, uh, essentially reservoirs uh, there is a tendency of this DNA to move towards the positive and as it moves it kind of fractionates and tries to light up so uh, the way you make these devices uh, using fabrication strategies uh, for microfabricated PDMS glass capillaries and the following manner you take a mask here and uh, essentially uh, you pre clean a glass slide and then spin coat uh, some photoresist material and expose selectively using this black and white transparency mask so that you can actually create these features on uh, the photoresist material okay this is a negative tone photoresist uh, may, maybe S20, SU8 uh, obtained from a company called Microchem you then follow it uh, uh, by actually pasting these uh, inlet outlet ports over this uh, particular master which is formulated and then essentially close or place this master inside a uh, you know a kind of petri dish and pour PDMS on the top of this master uh, before doing that you have to do some surface pretreatment here where you can actually make the surface highly hydrophil hydrophobic uh, so that it can uh, be able to not uh, or go do away with sticking without sticking to the uh, to the PDMS when it uh, hardens from uh, the liquid state okay and then once uh, this is done you can remove the the ports along with the PDMS uh, with the channel like structures and then plasma paste or plasma bonded over this uh, lower glass slide a uh, plain glass slide okay and that uh, would give you a device something looking like this so you have these uh, small small ports here on all four sides and this essentially is the crisscross channel uh, that you can see these are uh, real time optical micrographs of such devices so these are some detailed results and uh, this has now been published uh, as well so as you see here uh, the following observations are made if you apply a 300 volts across uh, these two electrodes or these these two reservoirs with the DNA uh, somewhere here and uh, with a voltage of 300 volts after 25 seconds you see that there is a plug like flow of the DNA okay so this really is the and this is the ladder that you are translating okay so this is essentially a 100 to 1000 base pair DNA ladder so when you are flowing it for about 25 seconds you see that uh, there is a small stain that is developed and lit up and this whole assembly is essentially placed over a trans illuminator okay this is placed over a trans illuminator and uh, that is why you can see or visualize this particular stain of interest here you use a 1.5 percent agarose solution in this micro channels now if you keep applying this for another 50 seconds another 25 seconds uh, it kind of splits up into these various uh, stains or bands in the same capillary as you can see so this is one of the finest examples of capillary electrophoresis okay and uh, 
essentially the mobility can be calculated in such stains uh, as this 9.1 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter square plus per volt second. The velocity of the stain would be about roughly 0 0.078 centimeter per second and the electric field uh, that is used is almost close to 85.7 volts per second. If you compare time wise to the conventional electrophoresis how much time uh, reduction happens in this case in the conventional electrophoresis normally occurs in about 35 minutes or so okay. This is a conventional electrophoresis where the ladder is split up in about 35 minutes as opposed to only 50 seconds a year. So, there is almost uh, um, close to you know 1 30th uh, or 1 40th time reduction uh, if you shift from the conventional to the capillary okay. So, this uh, is basically a reduction of 40 a factor of 40. So, it is a huge advantage to the industry because uh, we essentially look for rapid ways and means of doing um, uh, this you know DNA fractionation okay and this is one of the best uh, the very best methods which are available uh, in, in a capillary uh, where we can do the same job okay. So, this is another illustration where you can show electrophoresis happening inside a capillary uh, using a 750 base pair uh, porcine reproductive and respiratory. Uh, virus uh, syndrome it is essentially a dreaded disease in the swine herds in United States and across the other part of the world. So, essentially this virus uh, is uh, recognized. So, it is a viral disease and the virus is recognized by the 750 base pairs of a certain section of the genome of the virus uh, isolate ok. Uh, so, using agarose capillary and about 300 volts we have been able to successfully demonstrate electrophoresis in terms of these stains as you can see through in the capillary. So, uh, the mobility is calculated here at about 7.84 10 to the power minus 4 a velocity of the stain being about 0 0.0784 centimeter per second in a field of 100 volts per centimeter. And uh, in this second trial here the mobility slightly changes to 7.59 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter square per volt second and uh, the velocity of the stain is 0 0.065 centimeter per second in electric field about 85.7 volts per centimeter. These are some of the facts and figures which are um, important for knowing about uh, this electrophoresis process a little bit more. Another uh, fantastic example is uh, this from this paper uh, published uh, way back in uh, the you know the, the early 2000s. Uh, by essentially the Matisse group um, up at uh, UC Berkeley. So, essentially here what uh, Matisse and his group is trying to show is uh, a set of capillary array ok. This is instead of one capillary many capillaries on a radial plate like a CD and uh, there is a principle which is involved in the detection of DNA stains in this uh, particular uh, illustration. So, if you really look at one of the channels here let us say uh, we want to have a look at this one channel ok. Uh, essentially uh, something like this. So, you have two channels in this one structure or one unit of uh, the channel that is mentioned here independent channels two independent channels converging into this port here which is also at the center and it has a common anode ok. So, it is a positively charged uh, plate which is also a dispensing reservoir. These uh, two are the detection arms on both sides and these arms are uh, adjusted in a manner that you have uh, the sample ports outside and you have a crisscross channel on both sample ports from both sides of these main detection arms and uh, these are all connected integrally to uh, something like a waste uh, you know uh, collection center and then you have a cathode which is placed at the other end here of uh, the micro channel and an anode which is placed uh, somewhere here in the waste reservoir. And then when you the idea is that when you load the sample here and make it negative the sample uh, negatively charged by putting another electrode now the sample kind of electrokinetically gets injected into this detection arm and this detection arm and then the cathode and anode combination of these two across these two ends are able to you know these two ends this and this end they are able to drive the small samples which are caught in this detection arm 
all the way through the arm and in the process there are stains which are formulated in these two regions here and uh, essentially the CD has an additional advantage that you can actually calibrate uh, uh, and place a reader detector system which can actually go back and forth radially uh, and can what all stains are there on this capillary. So, there is a unique combination of the rotation rotary motion of this particular uh, you know micro capillary uh, containing CD and uh, in relation to the radial motion of the detector sensor assembly and that can help you to uh, kind of identify at least 96 and these are all 96 in number okay the separate channels are 96 separate channels are there in the CD like platform. So, you can actually at a time read about 96 uh, particular uh, reactions PCR reactions using this particular uh, capillary and so uh, this is also a very high throughput process that uh, Mattis and his group has developed before. Uh, you, you can actually also uh, take this particular channel and introduce a lot more uh, turns and uh, accommodate a lot more length of this channel. The only uh, thing here is to be a little careful in designing the way that these channels will twist and turn and that should not be done at the cost of the resolution loss of the DNA. So, there are some interesting work which has been done uh, in this capillary array electrophoresis area by various researchers around the world. Okay. So, after doing this uh, electrophoresis basics, I would like to turn your attention towards another very important uh, aspect known as uh, the design of a spatial or a space domain PCR reactor. So, when we were talking about uh, you know the PCR uh, reactor in general, we assumed that there is a small chamber contained in, sp uh, in, in time you know in space and the temperature contained at a fixed spatial location and contains a small volume of this PCR fluid and uh, we, we assume that the thermal cycling is done on this uh, uh, fixed spatial chamber uh, through uh, you know a, a temp on a temporal basis. So, with a time varying basis. So, these devices are also known as the time domain devices for PCR micro reactors. However, uh, one issue with these devices is uh, the very fact that you have to kind of heat a large amount of thermal mass associated with uh, the wafer or uh, you know the, the substrate or the base which would contain this chamber in it. And uh, therefore, uh, every time you have to ramp up the whole mass uh, to a certain temperature and ramp it down uh, in order to be able to uh, quickly do thermal cycling. However, this is uh, a very inconvenient uh, module because uh, the thermal mass and particularly the materials that we use uh, in microfabrication silicon glass uh, uh, then your uh, polymers they are all poor thermal insulators and uh, therefore, it does not give a very easy solution in terms of a rapid uh, ramp up or ramp down. So, another approach that uh, was very intelligently thought by a group in up at Oxford uh, Andreas Mann's uh, group uh, way back in about the early uh, part of this particular decade uh, was about space domain PCR reactors. So, instead of uh, one location and heating at various temperatures of that location what this group for the first time thought is that why not have three different heating zones on the same chip one heated to 95, one heated to 72, another heated to 50 and then you essentially move the PCR fluid around in these three different zones uh, by a serpentine path okay, and uh, in, in a serial manner. So, that the cycle which is essentially a 95 followed by a 50 followed by a 72 is followed um, and at the same time the PCR gets executed only by virtue of the motion of the droplet in these differentially heated areas of a single surface. Okay. So, this is called uh, this is a very novel approach okay, and also called uh, space domain PCR devices. So, I would like to draw your attention to how such a device can be designed it is essentially a challenging engineering problem. Uh, so, you have three different heating zones at different maintained at different temperatures and you have a serpentine path over these zones in which you are flowing or circulating the fluid. So, when it goes to the first zone you have to give it time enough for uh, the volume to go up to uh, at the temperature of the surface that is let us say 90 degrees and then also you have to wait uh, long enough 
for the whole denaturation step to happen. So, the, the total amount of time that this, uh, this small droplet should be present in the 90 degrees heated area is about uh, the ramp up time of uh, the mass of uh, the droplet to go to 90 degrees plus the denaturation time. Similarly, the amount of time that is needed to hold the drop in the 50 degrees area is essentially the ramp down time to the 50 degrees area times of uh, the amount of time it would take for the sample to be present in the extension step okay, or the annealing step actually. Uh, similarly, it goes true for the extension step. So, you have to design effectively the velocity of this droplet in a manner so that uh, length which is also equal to velocity into time would be able to accommodate or give sufficient time for the denaturation, the annealing and the extension process of a PCR to occur uh, in an easier manner. So, let us do an example here. We uh, now start designing such a spatial PCR reactor. Uh, as you see here, there are different zones 95, 75 and 56 designed uh, in a manner so that you know you can use probably microfabrication techniques to design this kind of a thing. So, you have uh, uh, the, the 75 degrees only en route between uh, the 56 degrees and the 95 degrees. Okay. Uh, there is an input output reservoir here and the understanding is that the droplet would be uh, moved in a direction so that it is able to uh, rest on you know this uh, this particular uh, area whatever the temperature is for a time duration where the whole effect can be felt in terms of a successful annealing a successful extension and a successful denaturation uh, time okay so the assumptions that we have to make for solving this uh, particular question is that uh, the denaturation extension and annealing time are in the ratio of 0 0.5 to 5 is to 0 0.5 seconds respectively. And uh, we also know that the spatial reactor has flow channel etched in glass with a channel depth of about 40 microns. Uh, the width is around 90 micrometers. We also have flow rates uh, ranging from 6 to 72 nanoliters per second. Uh, that is uh, the kind of flexibility that we have. And we have to design uh, the dimensions of this different differential temperature zones, okay. the length dimensions or the width dimensions of the differential temperature zones. Uh, if we assume that uh, all these zones have the same width. Okay. So, we are assuming that the zones the three temperature zones here has have the same width. So, we have to first uh, take into consideration some properties. So, we assume that the sample has properties of water all PCR fluids are basically aqueous based density would be about 1000 kg per meter cube specific heat capacity Current mass of water is about 4182 joules per kg Kelvin. Thermal conductivity is about 0 0.06 watts per Kelvin meter. So, the thermal uh, capacitance, if you look at of this particular uh, channel. Assuming that uh, the length segment is about L, okay. So you have L as the length segment 
of uh, the particular channel. So, C thermal will be given by so uh, be given by m times of c which is uh, again mass is essentially density of the medium times uh, area times the volume now you have to see what the area in this case is so the width of the channel being w and let us assume l to be the total length of the segment the wl is the facing area so this is the the heat face okay of the channel and of course the heat has to travel through the thickness uh, of the channel d uh, so wld essentially is what the volume of the channel would also be okay and now if we look at the thermal resistance in this case the thermal resistance from bottom of the channel to top of the channel uh, is estimated as R thermal is the depth D by K times of square of L in this case square of the A, A or, or you know square of essentially the area it's the area. So, area in this uh, particular case um, is also W times of L and uh, therefore, uh, the time constant for this thermal circuit which is also equal to R thermal into C thermal is essentially in this case rho C d square by k okay. and this comes out to be assuming this various values of density specific heat per unit mass C uh, the d value of about 40 microns and also the thermal conductivity of 0 0.06 watts per Kelvin meter this comes out to be 0 0.011 seconds okay. that is how the whole uh, time constant of this thermal circuit would be denoted by. So, uh, for designing any MEMS uh, based system uh, what is important is also uh, its, its reliability. Okay. And uh, here the question is that there is a small droplet which you are moving through different uh, zones of heating on a chip and you have to be 100 percent sure that uh, the droplet gets the time that it needs for executing uh, the, the whole denaturation time uh, along with uh, the time that it would need uh, for going to that temperature uh, which is 3 times of its time constant. And uh, uh, assuming that you have a maximum velocity uh, of flow uh, you, you can give uh, uh, the maximum tolerance to the system because anything lower than that uh, would be definitely able to get uh, that time of heating and the time uh, that the whole denaturation would take normally uh, otherwise to get completed. So, therefore, uh, we will do all the designing based on the maximum flow rate which is about 72 nanoliters uh, per second as uh, given in the problem statement was the maximum flow rate ok. So, uh, let us first find out what uh, the linear velocity u would be in case uh, the, the velocity of flow or the volume rate of flow is maximum. So, linear velocity is actually the volume divided by the area of cross section which is w into d in this particular case d is about 90 microns and w is about I am sorry d is about uh, 40 microns and uh, w is about 90 microns. So, it is 72 10, by 10 to the power minus 12 divided by 36 10 to the power of minus 10 okay. and this comes out to be equal to about 
0 0.02 meters per second. So, the time required for passing through the denaturation zone assuming uh, the denaturation time to be about 0 0.5 seconds as has been given in the problem statement again is uh, essentially the total time that this droplet should be in the 95 degrees zone is 3 times of time constant this 0 0.011 seconds times 3 plus 0 0.5 comes out to be 0 0.533 seconds and therefore, uh, since uh, the length of the channel needed in the denaturation jo zone is only. So, therefore, the length of the 95 degrees Celsius portion of the channel, channel should really be equal to this time here 0 0.533 times of 0 0.02 which is actually about 11 mm ok. And uh, since we were actually talking about a flow in this denaturation zone which is twice the length the length becomes equal to 5.5 mm. We do assume that this portion here uh, is essentially not um, very major um, you know length in comparison to uh, the length of the zone. Uh, this turn is essentially uh, neglected because of its uh, smaller magnitude. So, the length of the zone that we have been looking at is really about 5.5 millimeters. Now, uh, the same length is uh, true for the extension case because uh, we do not have uh, sorry the annealing case because we do not have a different time in the annealing uh, area, but for the extension case as you see here the time is about almost 10 times ok. So, let us look at how much uh, velocity uh, will uh, will be able to or how much length will be able to cover in the extension zone. So, the time needed for the extension to happen is essentially 3 times of 0 0.1101 seconds plus 5 uh, seconds. So, 5.033 seconds at the velocity of 0 0.02 meters per second uh, the total length that it would need to stay or cover or the total channel length that it would need to uh, be in this extension zone is 0 0.02 times 5.033 which is essentially uh, what what the total extension length would be. So, this is about 100 mm ok. assuming this was in meters per second this is about 100 mm. So, again the very fact that uh, you have one turn which is corresponding to about 0.55 or 5.5 mm uh, it is a design constraint that you cannot go over this in all the three temperature zones. So, you have to actually ask uh, the channel to serpentinely turn in this uh, extension area as can be seen here in the figure ok. So, this area essentially you have to ask the channel to turn multiple times in this particular area. So, that it can get heated as it uh, goes into the serpentine path and so the number of turns that this channel would need to execute in the 72 degrees area it is 100 divided by 2.5.5 2.5.5 which is essentially about 9 turns ok. So, you have to design uh, the PCR in a manner so that uh, you have uh, 
a space here which comprises of about 9 turns of this particular channel um, where the space is heated to about 72 degrees Celsius. So, the annealing zone characteristics are the same as the denaturation zone although in the extension zone you need to serpentinely coil the channels about 9 times in order to get the total time of extension so that the whole DNA pair can be copied. So, this in a nutshell is how you design a space domain PCR device or a PCR micro reactor ok. So, I would now like to actually delve into another very interesting area of biosensing and uh, that is essentially what you can do uh, using the self assembly skills of a DNA molecule a deoxyribonucleic acid molecule. So, this is a uh, so, what we, we are going to do now is uh, to kind of try and discuss some of the various uh, uh, detection diagnostics protocols that has been uh, promulgated by uh, the complementary team itself in the DNA chain and its ability to get self assembled over one another. So, one of the first papers in this area is uh, that uh, generated by uh, Alvisatos. Uh, and his group essentially is about gold nano clusters. So, what he found out is uh, a DNA mediated assembly process uh, way back in 1996 ok. So, here as you see there are uh, two complementary strands of DNA uh, which are exactly complementary when they bind to each other with high stringency and uh, what he has essentially done is that he puts these gold nano particles on both these strands separately and let them self assemble. So, that uh, uh, there can be uh, you know a, uh, an array or an arrangement of these gold nanoparticles. So, the moment that these, these two strands are totally complementary to each other and in fact, that is this is not the only binding kinetics that one may have here. One may have something like let us say you have this DNA molecule. Uh, with the gold nanoparticle here and you have uh, maybe another molecule uh, with a kind of complementary structure which is corresponding to a uh, few base pairs here and then it has its own base pairs which again bind to a third molecule ok. So, it binds to another third molecule here which has another of these particles and so therefore, there are um, several such st strands which, which by just by means of complementarity between the strands would keep binding to each other ok. So, that is how uh, these uh, self assembly the D DNA mediated self assembly process uh, would happen all right. How you get to know whether the DNA are self assembling is by looking at what happens after giving sufficient time for these particles to assemble. So, this is essentially a scanning electron micrograph uh, of these different gold particles as you can see they form these clusters. So, these are gold nano clusters which is indicative of the fact that they are bound together or held together now by the DNA functionalization which these gold nanoparticles have individually on their surface ok. So, essentially this is one of the first experiments which demonstrated that DNA mediated self assembly how, uh, how that uh, this, this approach can be used for putting together uh, nanoparticles. So, essentially a DNA strand is specific to its complement. So, use DNA as an address level an attachment system to assemble objects and uh, uh, the DNA can also be attached to these gold particles by using thiol chemistry. So, you modify one end of the, the DNA through a thiol SH group and uh, essentially uh, adsorb the SH onto uh, the gold nanoparticle uh, which uh, you know just by pure adsorption um, it can kind of conjugate or it can adsorb and, and then uh, become integral with one of these uh, 
side chains of the DNA. So, SH forms a metal thiolate band bond which is also the basis of the attachment here. Another uh, very interesting uh, work which has been probably reported by the same group is uh, one of the fundamentals of genomic detection. And this is one of the first uh, few works which indicate uh, the concept of DNA hybridization. Here of course, uh, what happens is that you have these uh, avidin coated polystyrene beads as you can see these are the avidin moieties on the top of the polystyrene beads ok. And avidin is essentially um, again a vitamin uh, which bonds very well to um, uh, you know biotin which is again uh, you know uh, some kind of a protein. So, essentially what uh, you do here is you coat avidin on these polystyrene beads and um, you make uh, a series of capture probes with some particulates at the end which could actually be immobilized on the top of maybe a gold substrate ok. So, essentially you are immobilizing this uh, half uh, stranded DNA molecule which is also a capture probe onto this gold surface using some thiolated chemistries. Now, what you do is uh, you bind the target with the biotin. So, you essentially biotinylate the target. Uh, there are ways and means of doing it and I am not going to get into the chemistry uh, details of that, but essentially there are kits now available uh, through which you can bind biotinylate proteins, DNA uh, all sort of uh, biological entities can be uh, biotinylated which means that a biotin group can be added on to the entities externally. And uh, essentially once this biotin target has been uh, realized you know this uh, when you flow the target and it is going to find its capture probe and getting bound to the to the capture probe ok at the location that it is intended for. And the biotin moiety on the capture probe are able to trap the avidin which you have already coated on the surface of this polystyrene bead. So, therefore, whenever there is a target binding to a certain capture probe it is indicated by a polystyrene big bead with the biotin surface function uh, the, the, with the avidin surface functionalization in turn binding to uh, this this half or, or this semi DNA or, or this uh, small part of the DNA tucking out of the hybridization assay. This bonding here between the yellow and red is also known as DNA hybridization ok. So, how do you detect such a mechanism? So, you use an AFM for doing that here if you look at uh, the two scans in the top scan essentially there is a control sample with no capture. So, there are no beads which are immobilized polystyrene beads which are immobilized as opposed to the captured cold uh, nanoparticles. You can see here that uh, these uh, polystyrene beads have been immobilized onto the surface by virtue of uh, the avidin coated to the to this uh, target DNA or oh sorry the, the biotin uh, you know conjugated onto the target DNA bound to the immobilized capture probe on the surface. So, by virtue of this it is like a hook which holds the polystyrene bead in place and therefore, uh, you, you can easily see that uh, the presence or absence of a right capture probe corresponding to the target would just make a difference in terms of laying out a signal as a bound polystyrene bead over the surface ok. So, this is another, another very interesting example of uh, how you can uh, make hybridization arrays between uh, a target and a capture probe DNA molecules. These are uh, some other illustrations where the exact uh, same uh, thing has been done, uh, but here as you see uh, there are about 8 microns gold dots over which the capture probes have been immobilized by using uh, thiolated chemistry ok. So, essentially uh, these dots here that you can see are 8 micron gold dots ok made of gold. And uh, what we do here is that in some of the dots we do not bind any capture probe and another and in others we do bind capture probes. So, essentially you are making some control and some reference uh, you know sites of binding. 
So, wherever there are these dots which uh, which kind of have the presence of the capture probe there is always a capture of the polystyrene beads as can be seen, seen here in the close up view. These small moieties here are the little polystyrene beads and the tiny beads which have gotten captured because of the presence of the capture probe. Okay. So, optically you could actually uh, using an optical micrograph or an optical microscope realize whether there is a binding going on between the target DNA and the capture probe just by looking at how these gold dots are whether they are with polystyrene bead or not. So, uh, the controls for some of these uh, experiments are non thiolated attachments with hybridization, thiolated attachment with non complementary hybridization and uh, essentially all PS beads all polystyrene beads are avidin coated. So, then there is no bead capture indicative of uh, there is a control. So, if there is a thiolated attachment however, and a complementary hybridization with biotin evident coated polystyrene beads capture on the pattern gold surface which gives us uh, an idea of what is uh, uh, the particular target because if it is complementary only then it is going to bind and we do have information on the capture probe which is going to bind it. So, we can just figure out what is the complementary of the capture probe uh, which is essentially the target in this particular case. So, now we come to another very interesting area which is uh, DNA hybridization microarrays. Now, this, uh, uh, this area is essentially a very big business nowadays uh, billions of uh, dollars uh, are involved in, in this diagnostics uh, uh, one area which uh, is about building of DNA microarrays. Okay. Uh, these arrays can be used uh, for a variety of applications including hybridization arrays and uh, and for different uh, applications like uh, you know this uh, rna expression monitoring applications uh, sequencing hiv resequencing uh, in general trying to detect uh, target dna or sense some target dna so on so forth and the very interesting aspect of uh, all this is how do you build uh, such microarrays or what is the basic principle or a basic mechanism of such microarrays. So, definitionally uh, hybridization essentially is the basis of detection of the unknown nucleotides. Okay. Uh, examples that come into picture are biochips for identification for DNA, hybridization of an unknown fluorescently tagged strand with a many with many known strands. Uh, reaction will determine the sequence of the unknown or vice versa. Okay. So, if you have um, an unknown target and you are wanting to hybridize it uh, with something which is known some capture probe which is a known sequence and you are able to somehow fluorescently tag uh, uh, the strand with a with, with many known strands. Okay. Now, the reaction will determine the sequence of the unknown or vice versa. So, strands can be lithographically or electronically defined at a specific location. So, there are two companies in the world which principally makes these microarrays. One of them is uh, Affymetrix which does uh, a molecular build up for the capture probes you know using light directed synthesis and uh, the other company which builds these uh, are Nanogen and they uh, kind of uh, give this uh, more to the user and they just build the electronics wherein electronically you can direct a particular capture probe to a certain site of interest within you know the micro the micro scale architecture that they would provide. Uh, so, let us look at what uh, these microarrays are. So, essentially it is all about building different sequences or a library of different sequences of DNA onto a single chip level. Here in the left uh, figure essentially if you are looking at uh, these numbers here S1, S2, S3, S4, S5 all the way up to S9. These are different uh, locations on the same chip and uh, uh, if we can somehow direct a specific sequence uh, of a capture probe of single strand DNA onto this uh, area S1 or the first column and first uh, row or the second column and first row and we have an accurate information of what is what. That means, what sequence is there in S1, what sequence is there in S2, so on so forth up to what sequence is there in S9. 
then if uh, uh, you know we, we bind the DNA with a fluorescent label uh, which is the target DNA essentially on to this and wash this plate only the bound will stay back because you have already immobilized the capture probe on this plate and the DNA which is fluorescently labeled is getting immobilized to the uh, already immobilized capture probe. So, it is essentially a hook between the plate and the new target molecule and that way gets bound. So, in case if you wash this plate uh, the binding goes away or the binding stays back or the bound DNA stays back and you still have the fluorescent signal which is indicative that there is binding or there is complementary, uh, com complementarity in the inlet st input strand the target strand based on which you could find out what is the sequence because you already know what is the sequence on the capture probe. So, this essentially is what uh, the DNA hybridization uh, principle is and the microarray, uh, the name as the name is indicative is essentially it is an array of uh, these different sites for doing or immobilizing different capture probes onto this particular site ok. Uh, so, basically that kind of brings us to the end of uh, this lecture. Uh, what is interesting here is that uh, we would now be uh, in probably the next lecture uh, working on uh, some of the uh, ways and means of placing these capture probes on the arrays or building these capture probes on the arrays. And we will be looking at some of uh, the companies like Nanogen and Affymetrix and the way uh, they immobilize these capture probes and build microarrays uh, and so essentially that will be covered in the next lecture. Thank you.